Good morning. How are you? Good, good. Wasn't, weren't they great? So let's give them a bit round. So happy Easter, everyone. For those of you who uh, might be new here, usually uh, we get the CEOs. No, sorry. <laughs> That's Christmas and Easter only, folks. No. <laughs> I know that many of you watch from home, and it's so great that uh, you came in for our Easter celebration. We're really going to have a wonderful morning for you. We've got some ritual plans. Um, but first, I want to uh, share a little bit. Um, my name is Reverend Alice Reed, if I didn't say that. And I am the senior minister here. And what I like to think of Easter, not of as Easter Day, but Immortality Day. Immortality Day. It's the, the day that is we recognize the resurrection. And uh, for many people around the world, they think of the resurrection as um, an opportunity for uh, the one and only Son of God that gave his life for our sins. But I'm here to remind you as religious scientists that we don't believe in sin. And you are not sinful. And in fact, you are already eternal. You did not need somebody to die on a cross for you to have eternal life. And so we're going to look at that a little bit today. I uh, was looking and doing a little research, and I found that despite the fact that about 60% of Americans identify as Christian. 80% celebrate Easter. That's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> I think it's, a, you know, it can be somewhat of a cultural holiday for many. It can be an opportunity for families to get together. It can be an opportunity to, to I don't know, feed children lots of sugar and candy first thing in the morning. <laughs> I, I loved Easter when my uh, kids were growing up. We didn't really go to church. Um, but, of course, we had the proverbial Easter basket. And um, at some point, I decided I was going to put healthy food in the, in the basket. It did not go over well. <laughs> it did not go over well. You know, that candy, that's a, it goes a long way on Easter Sunday. Sugar. I think it's a religion in itself in this country. <laughs> you know, as I, as I looked at the, the traditional practice of Easter, um, and uh, what I want to share with you is that um, before uh, uh, Jesus and the story of his life happened in the, at the beginning of, the, of uh, what is it, two, the second century, um, there was a holiday that was, and a festival that was celebrated by pagans. They celebrated the spring equinox, and they celebrated with quite a lot of pageantry, the renewal of life all around them, and they worshipped the goddess Estera. Sounds a little like Easter. <laughs> right? And they had this, this Ostera celebration, and, and it involved um, new life, and it, it spoke about fertility. And so they used eggs and rabbits, little baby bunnies, to represent the, um, the renewal of life and the newness and the returning of life in the springtime in the northern hemisphere. And so, you know, I think that our, much of our Easter really does come from those nature, religious, um, practices that have been around way longer than Christianity. And so we have bunnies, and like we have our own bunny on the stage this morning with Reverend Judy. Thank you for sharing your ears with us. Um, we have some eggs on the, on the altar here. Yes, all of that represents renewal and transformation, and life is forever transforming itself. And yet, sometimes we can forget that. We can forget about how the uh, transformation of life, that everything's always changing. 
there's that saying, the only thing consistent is change, right? The only thing that's consistent is change. And as I, look at, I looked at Easter and its origins, I uh, found out a little fact that in the very early days of uh, Christianity, when they were adopting Easter, that the Christians celebrated Easter at the same time that Passover was celebrated. And in fact, those two holidays, despite the fact that they don't always fall on the same day, sometimes they do, I think they did last year, um, there's a lot of commonality between those two uh, holidays and, and the, the recognition of freedom, freedom. So in, in the Easter ritual and celebration, we're recognizing the freedom of life, this, this eternal life that is promised to us conditionally. If they, we do certain things, we'll be accepted into heaven in the afterlife. And then in the Passover celebration, they're celebrating the, the freedom from slavery. And it's almost as if Christianity adopted this Easter holiday to say that this life that we live is slavery and that we will be free from it one day. I don't subscribe to that. <laughs> I do not subscribe to that. And I don't subscribe that there is some anthropomorphic God that has had this grand design that he was going to have his one and only son come to the planet, be tortured, only have three years to preach a beautiful message of love and compassion, only to be crucified and tortured so that he could be born again. I think it went something like this. There was a man who was mystical, and he was so connected to God that he preached this beautiful message of love and compassion, and he knew that he was immortal. He knew that life was eternal, but nobody else could accept that. So they freaked out. They killed him. And he rose above it to show us that life is eternal, to remind us that life is eternal. I think that's how it went down. I think sometimes the ways that some of the, um, I'll call them traditional religions, look at some of the spiritual truths, sometimes it's easier to accept a version where we don't have to take a lot of responsibility where we don't have to own our power. And so this Easter, as we look at the idea of, of resurrection, it's really transformation. I was fortunate enough to um, run across a wonderful message that um, our founder, Ernest Holmes, uh, gave in 1951. The message was entitled, You Are Immortal, and I'm going to share a couple of pieces of that with you this morning. So Ernest said, as wonderful as were the words and works of Jesus, the miracles of love and compassion which he performed, his whole mission, which was to stand to the world for all time and to all people, the climax of which was to prove that the spirit of man is indestructible, immortal, and eternal. Jesus plainly taught that the kingdom of God is at hand here and now. He goes on to say, he also taught that who and what we really are, the spirit incarnated within us, is some part of God and will live forever. His teaching would have been incomplete unless this were true. It would merely have been a wonderful code of ethics or morality, a high example of what every human being ought to be. But there was so much more to it than this. It was the final triumph of the spirit which he demonstrated, the complete emancipation of man from limitations of the flesh. It is the triumph of spirit that we celebrate today. Whew. Right. We 
are so much more than flesh and bone. We are so much more than this corporal material reality that we experience day to day. And on a day like today, on Easter, it's our opportunity to remember that, to remember who we are, to remember who we came here to be, to know that this experience has, it's, it's heavenly and it's wonderful and it's temporary. And that you were free and existed before you were born and you will be free and exist after you die and you are free today and we remind you of that. We remind you of that through classes. We remind you of that through the, um, the services that we do on Sunday. We remind you of that in our friendship circles. We remind you of that through our literature and our practices that you are an immortal and eternal being that, and that there is a part of you that has never been harmed will never be hurt and can never be destroyed. I was reading Rudolf Steiner. Anybody familiar with Rudolf Steiner? Oh, he's dense. <laughs> he's very dense and he's got some really amazing ideas. He, is, uh, um, he was a mystic and a scholar. He started the Montessori schools to his, he gave birth to that idea. He started something called biodynamics where he began to understand how all of the planets and Earth, if you worked with them in concert and harmony, that you could grow food that was healthier, stronger, it was more nutritious. He was a man before his time and he, he lived in the late um, 1800s, early 1900s. And he wrote a little piece called The Mystery of Golgotha. The Mystery of Golgotha. Now, Golgotha is said to be the site of where Jesus was crucified and resurrected. If you look for it on a map, you won't find it. It does not exist in today's world. But they built a church on top of the place that they believe was Golgotha, called the Holy Sepulchre. And it's in Jerusalem, and you can visit it. I, I actually had the pleasure of going there in 2016 when I was on my own pilgrimage because I was still struggling with this idea that Christianity had been um, touting of uh, religion where God had to manifest his own son and then kill him and resurrect him for us, for us to be okay. I, I, I was just, it, it doesn't fit with me. And there was some kind of wounding in me. And so I, I did this pilgrimage and I, and I went into the Holy Sepulchre and I, and I had a wonderful experience. I, um, I did a meditation and I sat with myself and the energy there was really powerful. But what I want to share with you most importantly is that there is an opportunity for all of us to begin to understand the mystery of Golgotha. That Golgotha offers to us the real truth about our um, eternality. The resurrection story is merely a demonstration of the true freedom that is available to us. And the mystery of Golgotha is that humanity hasn't gotten it yet. I still think that there's a, a God's brought his only son to the planet to crucify and sacrifice him. There's still a deep belief of that, but the mystery, the mystery that we uncover is that we, there is no condition on our freedom. There is no condition on our eternality or our immortality. There, there, it is unconditional. You are already living in heaven on earth today. The kingdom of God is within you. You are all divine beings. And so this Easter, I want us to remember that. And so I want to do, um, wait, uh, there's one more piece I want to read from um, Ernest Holmes' talk before we do this. 
He said, what would your reaction and mine if we knew, what would be your reaction and mine if we knew the only thing we could take with us when we leave this world would be that which we really are? Would not our reactions be more kind and gentle? Would not our very possessions seem less value, valuable? And should we not come finally to realize that the only things that are really worthwhile are those things which cannot change and are changeless? And above everything else, should we not come to live as though we were immortal beings now? There is no original sin. There is only the original blessing. The original blessing that you are God expressing itself in human form. That this human form that we experience on a very tactile level every day is temporary and that encapsulated in your human form is your true divinity. On that um, pilgrimage, tell the camera I'm moving, <laughs> on the pilgrimage that I went on in 2016, I also, um, it was an amazing trip. I was gone for a month and I was in seven countries and 11 cities. And one of the cities that I visited was um, Turkey, uh, Ephesus in Turkey. And uh, they took us to the shrine of the Virgin Mary and the house that she supposedly lived in. And uh, there was a wonderful uh, prayer wall where people would tie their prayers up in little pieces of fabric along the wall. And they would, um, and then there was a fountain and while I was there, I had a water bottle, so I scooped up a bunch of that holy water from the shrine that had been prayed on over and over again for God knows how many, you know, hundreds of years. And I brought it back with me. And so today we're going to do a ritual. And the ritual is going to involve an anointing and a blessing. Now, an anointing, traditionally, is when someone recognizes the sacred and the divinity in someone else. And so our, um, our um, members of our ecclesiastical team in a minute will come up and um, you will be invited to come forward and to have an anointing, to have someone remember for you and to claim for you your divinity and to bless you with this water that has been prayed over, not only in Turkey, but prayed over for the last uh, eight years since I brought it home. And I'm happy to share it with you. And for those of you that are at home, I'm going to invite you to simply put your hand on your heart and to accept your blessing and to accept an anointment, an anointment of your divinity that you are divine, that there is no part of you that is not divine, and that you are blessed. And so I'd like to invite our ecclesiastical team members to come up. We have some water on the altar. And if we'll line up here, this is your invitation, if you would like, to come forward and receive a blessing. I will, what you
you ecclesiastic team and thank you all for allowing us to bless you like this this morning I have to I have a a little reading from Rumi to end with to take this home with you it's called don't go back to sleep the breeze at dawn has secrets to tell you don't go back to sleep you must ask for what you really want don't go back to sleep people are going back and forth across the door sill where the two worlds touch don't go back to sleep the door is round